Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the February 2023 Outdoor Ethics and Conservation Roundtable. Uh, so glad to see all of you here tonight. Tonight's topic is going to be conservation at BSA's high adventure bases. Uh, we're going to start off uh, right now, and uh, I believe we're going to do a quick retake on the agenda here. We're going to move the safety minute to later in the in the um, uh, program. We'll talk about uh, conservation, the main topic, and we have a, a new feature that we're starting this month, and we are going to try and do a frequently asked question and do a question you know, uh, that we've heard a lot and give an answer to it during the uh, roundtable. Uh, we'll have a few announcements, and then we'll have time for Q&A after that. Um, throughout the roundtable, please uh, use the chat to put in any questions you have. We'd love your questions, so please put them in there. Another thing I ask you to put in the chat, if you've got any ideas for topics you'd like to see at a future roundtable, I am always looking for topics. Please put those in the chat as well. I'd love to, to hear your ideas. So with that, I think it's time for us to start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Scout salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Two. Scout oath. Scout sign. On my honor, I will do my best to do my duty to God and my country and to obey the scout law, to help other people at all times to keep myself physically strong, mentally awake, and morally straight. The Scout Law. The Scout is trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. Two, join me in the outdoor code. As an American, I will do my best to be clean in my outdoor manners, be careful with fire, be considerate in the outdoors, be conservation-minded. Okay. So tonight's topic is conservation at, oh, hang on, we've got here. Paula, are you ready to jump in with the safety moment? Okay, we'll come back to this later. So let's go ahead um, with conservation at uh, BSA's high adventure bases. Um, <laughs> to kick this off, I'm gonna turn this over to uh, another fellow member on the national committee, and that is Ted Weiland. Ted Weiland is um, very active in the conservation space and he can introduce our speakers for you, Ted. Yeah, uh, so my name is Ted Weiland. Uh, I'm the Midway South Division Manager on the Outdoor Ethics and Conservation uh, National Subcommittee. Uh, and I've had the pleasure to work personally with both of our guests tonight. Uh, so Ben Harper is the current field manager at Philmont. Uh, ben and I both work on OA trail crew staff in 2015. Uh, and then we'll also have Sean Ferrier from the cold Northland of Northern Tier where he is the Associate Director of Program. Uh, and Sean and I served on the Northern Tier staff for uh, several summers uh, in the early 2010s. So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, uh, both my good friends here and to talk about their respective programs. And I believe uh, Ben will be up first uh, to talk about the programs at Philmont. Thanks, Ted. Uh, appreciate the, the introduction always. Um, cool. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Ben Harper. Uh, like Ted said, I'm the field manager here at Philmont Scout Ranch. Um, I first came to Philmont in 2012 uh, on an OA trail crew. Um, I was on conservation staff um, seasonally from 2014 to 2020. Um, much of that time being spent um, with uh, the OA trail crew, either in the field as a foreman um, or um, supporting the program. Um, I, after 2020, um, I went to work in some other places for, for the federal government, 
um, and some other other organizations. Um, and then just this past April, I came back um, as the field manager. Um, in my current capacity, I'm in charge of all of our recreation infrastructure. Um, so that's all of our trails and our camps. Um, and so I oversee all of our uh, projects like that. And I'm also uh, heavily still involved with all of our individual programs here at Philmont. Um, so the conservation department runs four individual programs. Um, next slide. Or do I control that? There we go. Okay. So uh, Baba Diom um, was a Senegalese forestry engineer who is very involved um, in uh, the public education sector. And in 1968, at a UN conference on conservation, he said, uh, in the end, we will conserve only what we love, we will love only what we understand, and we will only understand what we are taught. Um, here at Philmont, we have taken a little twist on that. Um, we teach through doing. Um, and so we have uh, changed this a little bit um, we will only understand what we have discovered for ourselves. That is our uh, kind of ethos when working with youth um, is that uh, really we find that the best learning in the outdoors comes through um, personal engagement and discovery. Uh, next slide, please. So the conservation department, um, we are approximately 100 seasonal staff um, we are led by four of us uh, permanent staff here. Um, so and that 100 staff is in the summer. Um, we run about 20 to 40 uh, in the fall and winter, depending on the projects that we have. Uh, we design, construct, and maintain um, the 1,200 plus individual campsites at Philmont. We survey, build, and maintain uh, more than the 350 miles of backcountry trail we have here. We monitor and control invasive species populations at Philmont. We create and implement uh, wildlife health programs. Uh, we create and implement uh, ecological restoration initiatives. We design and implement a good number of the education initiatives that happen here at Philmont. We collect, organize, and use GIS data for ranch-wide projects, uh, most notable being um, the navigation maps that we have every year. Uh, we design and implement forest thinning projects and we lead over 250 youth in individual programs every summer. Next slide, please. So uh, we develop youth and young adults for three primary reasons. Uh, for the recreational and educational use to the BSA and scouting movement as a whole, uh, to help staff and participants develop a strong ecological relationship to the land, and to create future staff members and ranch leaders. Uh, all of these things are important in all of our development programs um, because it helps create uh, good future leaders within the BSA and scouting. Um, it helps create uh, good, um, uh, good leaders um, in the civil world and in their home units. Um, and on a selfish note, uh, we recruit very heavily uh, from these individual programs for the next generation of uh, Philmont conservation staff. Next slide, please. The uh, department's individual programs uh, work on special projects primarily. Um, they work on the, uh, so the OA trail crew uh, for the past decade um, has been slogging away at a new Mount Phillips trail. Uh, but in addition to that, our other programs work on projects uh, such as prescribed fire preparation, uh, stream restoration, trail maintenance, um, they do uh, habitat monitoring uh, with our natural resource and our wildlife team. Um, and they also help with some of those um, data collection projects that I talked about. Our individual programs install a conservation land ethic in our participants and future staff. Uh, they expand participants' scientific knowledge, understanding of land management practices and critical thinking skills. They provide character development through servant leadership, and they develop strong outdoors and backcountry skills. Um, so uh, all of our programs here are recruitment tools for additional staff. Um, 
about one third of the entire ranger department is made up of staff from individual programs. Um, and that number is uh, a little bit lower for the conservation department. It's about 40% right now um, of our staff who have come from individual programs. Um, so, so we looked very highly upon them um, for any sort of uh, staff application. Um, and that uh, you know translates if you've done an individual program at the summit or a tier, uh, we also look highly upon that as well. So uh, next slide, we have four individual programs that we offer here. We have our trail crew trek, our roving outdoor conservation school or rocks, our STEM trek, and then our order of the arrow trail crew. Um, and some of the generic cells uh, for all of these programs is that uh, they are cheaper than regular treks for the most part. Um, all uh, get participants to Philmont who don't have advisors and scouts from their home unit who are able to go with them. Um, so if you have maybe one or two people from your home unit, uh, you can participate in one of these individual programs, even if you don't have a full crew. And they're a great way uh, to get back to the ranch if you've already been out on a, um, on a regular trek here. Uh, anyone who says that Philmont uh, is a once in a lifetime experience is, uh, you know, full of it. Uh, they don't know what they're talking about. Philmont, uh, you can do as many times as you want, and it is still just as great as the first time. So next, um, our trail crew trek is a 14-day co-ed trek for ages 16 to 20. So that is uh, older, 16 or older, but not yet 21. Um, it is a two-week trek combining work projects with classic Philmont program. Um, so uh, the way TCT works is that you hike out to a project site and maybe you do some trail maintenance there for a day. Uh, and then you hike and you uh, meet up with a conservation work crew, one of our staff crews, um, and you do some campsite work or some other maintenance work there. Um, and then you'll hike uh, again and you'll do some program. Uh, and then you'll meet up with uh, maybe our invasive species team um, and do some invasive species removal. Uh, and then you'll do some more program and you'll hike some more. Um, but but we, for TCT, we mix in uh, work projects with program um, in order to um, teach a variety of different skills, uh, all focused on uh, recreation infrastructure. Um, so it focuses on building conservation work skills and program management, uh, specifically in the worlds of recreation resource management and outdoor ethics and policy. Uh, like I said, this one's really focused on um, that recreation infrastructure side of things. Um, and TCT really encourages land stewardship at home through communities, councils, governmental agencies, and nonprofits. Uh, this year in 2023, for a two week trip, uh, Trail Crew Trek will cost $475. All right, next. So uh, the Roving Outdoor Conservation School, ROCKS, is a 21-day co-ed trek, again, for ages 16 to 20. Um, it is a place-based experiential education experience uh, with lessons covering a uh, wide amount uh, of environmental science and management principles in a very in-depth and hands-on sort of way. Uh, participants are taught uh, by two staff members supplied by Philmont uh, called environmental educators. Um, and they are also uh, taught by guest speakers who are specialists in their fields to discuss uh, resource management and career opportunities. Uh, so one of the really cool things about Northern New Mexico is it's a very tight knit and small community. Um, so we have um, neighboring uh, agencies. So we have uh, people from State Game and Fish come out and teach lessons. Uh, every now and then we get folks from the Forest Service. Um, we have, uh, the, so the rangeland management uh, here is taught by the Philmont Cowboys. Um, we have our, our ranch forester and wildlife biologist. Uh, I even teach a few lessons in this one. Um, we all go out and we talk about our specific fields um, and discuss different things with the participants. Um, so that way they can kind of Kind of ask some of those super specific questions um, that their staff members might not have the exact answer to. Uh, ROCKS also, also focuses on implementing the scientific methods, uh, lab resources, and monitoring strategies 
Uh, again, it's a much more in-depth um, educational experience. Um, and a lot of that experience um, is done through a 40, 40 hours of conservation work. Um, like I said, one of the best ways that we know to learn um, is to do things. So um, the rocks uh, programs, they will go to the stream restoration work site and they'll work for a day or two with the stream restoration team. Um, we give them, you know, waders and they get in the creek bed and uh, build beaver dam analogs and single rock structures um, and, and get their hands dirty and really practice um, and get familiar with the principles that they're learning about. Um, they do forestry work, they do trail work, uh, they do invasive species removal, they do uh, animal monitoring, uh, habitat um, data inventory, they, they do all sorts of stuff. I mean, it's really a very cool and unique program within the BSA um, for youth that are looking for um, an educational experience, a longer trek, um, or, or just, you know, they're considering pursuing careers um, in the, the outdoor industries. Uh, so our next uh, individual program is our STEM trek. Um, and this is a 12 day co-ed trek ages 14 to 17. Um, this is an introductory level program. So it's for that younger high school age group. And it's focused on building the foundation of skills and knowledge required to explore the outdoors. Uh, so not only is that um, the experiential education um, with, uh, you know, kind of kind of the same lessons as rocks, um, but it is also it's, it's really focused on building good um, outdoor skills and a good introduction to uh, the environmental science world. Um, these lessons are geared for uh, that younger age group. They still um, do things with the scientific methods and lab resources and monitoring strategies, but on a much more surface level. Um, there are normally some guest speakers who talk um, and teach lessons here as well. But again, it's really focused on that broad overview for that younger age group. Um, and it's really focused on developing um, the curiosity and learning skills required to have an effective second experience at Philmont and to continue to improve their skills through their home units. All right, uh, next please. Uh, the last one uh, is the Order of the Arrow Trail Crew. Um, this is the, the one that's near, near and dear to my heart. Um, but uh, all of these programs are, are phenomenal experiences. OATC is a 14-day uh, co-ed trek, ages 16 to 20. Um, we have three co-ed sessions throughout the summer and six uh, male-only sessions. Um, it is one week of trail construction followed by one week of trek. Um, and that trek is uh, designed on site by the OA trail crew foreman with the input of the crew. So it's a totally unique trek every single time it happens. Um, participants work and collaborate with airmen from all over the country. Uh, they, it is the uh, focus on the development and practice of leadership skills and the thoughtful implementation of the ideals of the OA. Um, really this trek is focused on um, taking all the principles of um, the order of the arrow and of the scouting experience as a whole and putting them into practice with a group of people who are all there for the same reason. Um, to give back to uh, Philmont and the BSA to have a great time um, and to, to really expand their leadership skills. Um, so, so, so this one, um, like I said, is really focused on that character development um, and kind of taking, taking your own um, leadership abilities in specific uh, to the next level. Uh, everything that you're taught all through scouting uh, is put into practice here. Um, and it's really the participants that lead the trek. Um, the foremen are, are just there as guide rails to make sure um, that, you know, nobody takes a wrong turn and ends up at Dean Cow when you wanted to be at head of Dean. Um, they're about 15 miles apart. So it's kind of a big deal. <laughs> all right, next. So uh, what can you do um, to help us out here? Um, so uh, your, um, with your help, we can increase participation in all of these programs um, just by mentioning it to one or two um, members of your district uh, or your home troop uh, or your camp staff even. Um, you have the ability to get a scout back to Philmont 
uh, for a lower cost, uh, either for a second or third time or for a first time even. Uh, and you could possibly put them on track to be giving back to the ranch with their own skills. Uh, these treks really occur during the formative years of young adulthood, and they very heavily contribute to future decisions uh, and paths of all of these young people that we work with. Um, that link there is the uh, link that takes you to the Philmont uh, Treks website, um, and that has all of the programs that Philmont offers, um, including a few of the ones that I didn't talk about here today, um, including our Rayado program and our Ranch Hands program, um, NAIL, the National Advanced Youth Leadership Experience, um, is another phenomenal program here at Philmont, um, and registration and information um, is all on that page there. Um, and so that is the, uh, the, the end of my short little blurb here. Um, does anyone have any questions um, that I can answer? If you do, pop them into the chat, please. Okay. Let me see. Is there see a program what... for 21 and up? Is there a program for 21 and up? Um, so we uh, run a alternative spring break program through the conservation department called Fill Break. Um, and that is for uh, anyone of any age in the BSA. Uh, Philmont also offers um, autumn adventure programs, um, which are a, um, they're, they're a trek at Philmont in the fall. Uh, there, there's no, uh, really nobody else here, so there's no backcountry program. Um, so it is just hiking. Uh, that is open open to all ages, but it is not an individual program. You have to assemble a crew and come as a crew. There is, okay. The Council of Conservation Committees get told which scouts from their council attend per, or participate in these programs. Um, so uh, that is a question that you will have to ask your scout executive. Um, all individual participants um, are, are, are vetted uh, <laughs> through, through the local council to make sure that they are indeed registered and current uh, with their dues in their local council. Um, okay. We do not reach out to individual committees. Are there any female treks, all female? Uh, so uh, we do not um, have female only treks anymore. Um, in the conservation department, because we uh, run such a few, such a, we run a smaller number of people through the conservation department for each program. Um, so the best way to give the most people the most access is to have co-ed treks for each of the different sessions um, for each program. Um, the Rayado program uh, has all female crews, uh, but not in the conservation department. Okay. What's the size of each group? Um, yeah, so every crew is up to, we, we will take a maximum of 12. Um, we prefer to keep it at 10, but, but if, if we've got some really excited young folks, um, we're not gonna say no. Uh, so, so, so we cap it at 12. Um, Order of the Arrow Trail crew runs 20 people at a time, um, but they split into two groups after the work week. Okay. All right. Um, I think that's the questions here. Okay. So thank you very much, Ben. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. I guess at, at this point, uh, Sean, are you ready? Yeah, I think so. Um, so thanks for the invitation. Uh, probably won't be quite as thorough as Ben because uh, Northern Tier is a much smaller operation and tends not to have quite as much going on, um, but uh, going off the introduction. So my name is Sean Ferrier, a lifelong scout. Um, came up to Northern Tier through as a participant through OA Wilderness Voyage, our biggest conservation program in Northern Tier. Came back a few years later as a seasonal staff member, worked through the ranks for several years, and then uh, started on the full-time team at Northern Tier in 2016, overseeing uh, basically all of the, the weird little things that Northern Tier does. Uh, so I've spent the last couple of years managing Northern Tier's winter and Canadian programs. Um, so a little bit more, uh, 
uh, off the beaten path, if you will, but a whole lot more fun, at least in my opinion. Um, so yeah, we'll jump into uh, the next slide. So um, Northern Tier, uh, like Philmont, one of the National High Adventure bases, we're actually celebrating our 100th anniversary this summer. Um, so we're all pretty excited about that um, up here. Um, and the big thing about Northern Tier is really everything we do here is focused around getting young people out into the woods to really develop an appreciation for uh, the quiet spaces, um, you know, getting them out of the city, out of civilization, away from roads, away from cabins. Um, you can come to Northern Tier and uh, you won't see a single road, sidewalk, building, uh, even signs for the next hundred miles, uh, which is a pretty unique opportunity in North America, at least in the United States. Um, so yeah, one of our uh, limitations when it comes to conservation efforts is that uh, the vast majority, basically all of the programs that we do at Northern Tier take place on public lands. So uh, we don't have quite as much opportunity to go out and build trails and uh, really manage our conservation efforts the way that Philmont does. We're working with uh, partner organizations, the US Forest Service and various Canadian Park Services. Uh, so we're kind of limited to what we're able to accomplish within that framework. Um, but we do have a couple of programs that um, give scouts a chance to give back to uh, the natural places that we use uh, here in this area. If you can go to the next slide. Um, so really the bulk of our conservation uh, programs at Northern Tier um, exist as individual programs. Uh, we've got two programs for Order of the Arrow members, uh, Order of the Arrow Wilderness Voyage and OA Canadian Odyssey. Uh, both programs have very similar formats. Uh, the only real difference is that Wilderness Voyage takes place in the United States. And I'll let you kind of guess where Canadian Odyssey um, spends most of their time. Um, both programs are two-week experiences for members of the Order of the Arrow who are at least 16 years old, but not yet 21. Um, both of those programs, scouts will come up um, and get placed in a crew of other individuals. Um, they'll spend their first week out in the wilderness uh, doing uh, repair and maintenance work on the various portage trails in the area. So our uh, staff that lead these trips, they spend a couple of days at the beginning of the season working with U.S. Forest Service uh, representatives to make sure that they're familiar with the area, the sort of work that we do, uh, the various features that we perform, uh, and all of those sort of things to make sure that they're as, as equipped as possible to, to manage those projects. Um, a lot of our work is preserving and maintaining trails that have existed in this area for hundreds of years. Um, so, you know, taking trails that have been trampled for generations and trying to make them just a little bit uh, easier and safer for travelers to maintain. And those are both scouts and the general public. Um, so anything from uh, corridor clearing to building steps, um, turnpikes, uh, all of those sort of things, uh, generally trying to keep people on trails and water off trails uh, is kind of the big thing. And then the second week of those experiences um, is a trek through the wilderness, uh, focusing on some various program elements designed to strengthen uh, those scouts' uh, understanding of uh, leadership, uh, their own uh, limitations uh, and attitudes, um, as well as the qualities that make leaders and reinforcing the virtues and principles of scouting, as well as the Order of the Arrow specifically. Um, so those are our OA programs. Uh, and then our uh, second kind of newer, smaller conservation program uh, we call Forest Corps. Uh, similar structure, it's a 14 day experience. Uh, this one is designed for scouts uh, 14 to 20. So uh, slightly uh, younger possibilities, um, still all youth, uh, youth or youth-ish based programs. Um, 
and similar format, a uh, two week program where they spend a week doing conservation work uh, and then a week paddling around the wilderness. Uh, the main difference there is that Forest Court uh, kind of lends itself to a more of a STEM Trek type approach. Um, we call it the roving classroom uh, program uh, where the scouts um, throughout their trek um, learn about uh, you know, local history, human history, um, wild, wild biology, um, geology, uh, all of those sort of things, fire ecology, um, and, you know, various topics like that. Um, so yeah, uh, next slide, please. Uh, and then, of course, we host a Leave No Trace Master Educator course every year, uh, usually in August. Um, part of our educational efforts to help spread the word. Uh, Leave No Trace is a huge part of what we do at Northern Tier. It's uh, We're in one of those unique places where uh, Leave No Trace principles literally are the law of the land. Uh, everybody that visits the Boundary Waters, uh, when they go in to pick up their permits, um, uh, has to review and initial next to uh, the laws of the Boundary Waters, which in many cases are basically word for word the seven principles of Leave No Trace. Uh, so a big part of uh, not just our individual programs and our uh, LNT Master Educator participants, but everybody who comes to Northern Tier uh, spends their entire trek focusing on um, and learning about various leave no trace ethics and principles and those sort of things. I just saw the question on the chat. Um, yeah, the leave no trace master educator course um, does uh, involve the canoe trek. So it's the LNT syllabus um, within an emphasis on canoe camping. Um, so yeah, and then. Um, most crews, we can go on to the next slide. So most crews that attend Northern Tier don't necessarily do conservation projects because of limitations with uh, the land management agencies. But generally speaking, um, we do a handful of different projects um, as a staff at Northern Tier. So in addition to Leave No Trace education, um, we do a pretty substantial amount of uh, native species uh, reforestation uh, around our uh, base property. Um, we've got some alumni and local experts that come in throughout the year, um, thinning out um, less desirable species and planting uh, mostly white pines, trying to reforest uh, those. Uh, and then every year we spend a couple of weeks in the fall uh, clearing trails that tie into the backside of our property to help uh, support uh, the various programs that we have. Um, so yeah, and then like I said, uh, most crews, um, I think we've got somebody unmuted. Um, most of our crews uh, don't do too much conservation unless they're visiting one of our two Canadian camps. Um, up, in, up in Canada, we have two smaller bases that send about you know, 50 to 100 crews each summer. Uh, and those crews actually do get to get their hands dirty a little bit, um, you know, mostly doing corridor clearing. Um, part of the remote rugged nature of those areas uh, involves um, traveling through a wilderness area that doesn't have any conservation crews um, maintaining it. So a lot of the work that's done to uh, keep those trails active, uh, or basically all of the work that's done to keep those trails active is um, performed by Northern Tier crews. Uh, every time you get to a portage, you'll usually cross the trail with saws and loppers um, to keep the trail open and then actually cross the trail to uh, travel. Um, so that's kind of a fun opportunity that uh, scouts get to do um, to give back and support um, the program and wilderness areas there. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so yeah, and then uh, that's basically what we've got conservation wise at Northern Tier, um, other than just the day to day, you know, uh, building into uh, our lives. Great. 
Sean, do you know the current prices for the uh, OA Wilderness Voyage, Canadian Voyage? Um, that is a very good question. Uh, I would have to look that up. I believe um, we had kept the price the same for, for a while. Um, at the risk of giving out false information, I'd, uh, I would say to uh, you could visit our website, ntier.org, uh, or also check out the uh, Order of the Arrows website where all of those reservations are handled. It's oa-bsa.org, um, and they'll have all of the most up-to-date information. Sean, I, I happened to log in to Knowers and took a look, and it's currently $300. Cool. That's that's what I was thinking. I just didn't want to want to misspeak, so thanks for that. Well, thank you, Sean. So we have uh, another person uh, who's joined us tonight uh, who worked on the STEM staff at Seabase. Uh, Evan O'Dell, would, would you be willing to share a little bit about conservation at Seabase? Yeah, I could do that. So I worked at Brinch Environmental Center, which is the, more the southern base. It's a little bit smaller. And they have two programs for youth that are about conservation, and the staff do a lot of art of that. So we have a coral nursery that has about 20,000 corals in it that the staff work in for about a third of their time at sea base. We do two weeks of program and one week of coral work, so we call it. And we keep poor corals alive and thriving in order to plant it out into nature. So we go to Luke Key, which is a na national marine sanctuary. We go plant out corals into there to keep the, the coral thriving sustain off massively due to climate change and other factors. Uh, and then we have two programs for Seabase. We have the Marine STEM program, which is what I worked in. And what they do is it's a week-long trek for uh, troops. So you have to have one group of people to go together. And they spend every night on base. So they sleep in air-conditioned dorms with bunk beds, the nicest program at Seabase. They eat breakfast and dinner on base with hot, fresh meals. And they go do day trips out each day. They do two circling trips out to different reefs. They go do um, coral health surveys. So they go record data for scientists. And they do fish population surveys. So they also record more fish data. They do one day of shark tagging. They go out into the open ocean and they catch 10, 20 foot sharks. They tag it and do a bunch of research on sharks. They go to Big Mutson Island, which is a private island owned by Seabase, about six miles north of Brenton. And it's a barrier island, so it's primitive, undeveloped, no buildings on it. And we go do different science programs. They pick up trash and weigh it, do some analysis on the trash. We do um, mangrove density measurements, so we figure out how much mangroves are on the island. Uh, do a few other surveys, so like seaweed, we'll count the amount of seagrass on the island other stuff. We get a lecture from Dr. David Vaughn, who is the pioneer of coral restoration. He's like the big main scientist about corals. And he comes talk to him for an hour, and then we take him out into the nursery that we run, and we teach the scouts about how coral works and the health and how to manage them. So we get them hands-on. They go in the water, they clean up snail poop, they do water quality measurements, and they help us do the work for the corals to keep them alive so we can plant them out into nature and save the coral reefs. And then we have OA Ocean Adventure, which is an OA high adventure program. Two weeks. One week is currently it's on Big Mutson Island. It used to be on Dry Tortugas because um, that COVID messed up with the Dry Tortugas National Park. So they go to Big, uh, Big Mutson Island and they do mostly trail work and a few other projects. We'll plant mangroves sometimes. We'll pick up a bunch of trash maintain campsites, a bunch of different projects on the island to help BSA. Um, and then they do a week of their own program. They can go fishing five days a week. They can go snorkeling every single day. They can do everything, whatever they want. They choose what they want to do. They can go sailing, go to Key West for a day and hang out. They choose, same as Philmont and Northern Tier, where they pick their own adventure. Same as Seabase. We use all Seabase resources. That's about it for what I know. Northern or Island Marauda has more programs that I'm not familiar with. So I can't talk on Island Marauda, but Brenton has 
do youth programs that you can sign up for about conservation. That's all. Thank I you, know. Evan. Great. And we also have uh, someone, Kat Lothian, who can speak to us a bit about uh, conservation at Summit. Kat? Hi. Um, so I am one of the seasonal staff here at the summit this summer. I'll be the assistant camp director for our scout camp. Um, so at the summit, we have our Order of the Air Summit Experience, which is an eight day event um, that participants spend most of their time working with the National Park Service, building trails and uh, maintaining them both on our property and on their property. Uh, and then they spend two days doing different um, activities on summit property, um, typically white water rafting and zip lining. Um, and then I think they also have some free choice. Um, we did a, used to have a conservation um, department that supported service projects at our scout camp, but due to not being able to hire enough staff, we haven't really been able to support that. Um, so if you know any people who would like to work service projects at the summit, uh, send them our way. Thank you, Kat. Appreciate it. Had any closing thoughts? Well, what I'm hearing is that there's a lot of great opportunities for young people to get engaged with, with conservation projects at a very high level at our National High Adventure bases. Uh, and so I think those are some opportunities that we as generally interested in outdoor ethics and conservation sustainability should promote, you know, back at our at our councils and our districts and our units. And we should, uh, you know, keep Ben and, and Sean and um, Kat and 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 folks, uh, you know, those young people working at those bases busy during the summer uh, and just helping maintain uh, the reputation that we have as a premier training organization that specializes in conservation. Thank you, Ted. If you think of any more questions, we can we can come back to them at the end of the uh, end of the round table. So you know if you're one of these people that's like, oh I thought of something. No, don't worry, it's not too late. All right, thanks. So with this, if I can do this. Nope. Oh, well. Paula, you had a safety moment for us. Can, uh, want me to bring that screen up for you? Please. Okay. There it is. Okay, let me fix this, see if this is going to work. Well, hello, everybody. As I was getting ready to do this presentation for the last three days, I got a really nice one all worked up and I realized that I had heard it before. So I decided I'd start doing some research to make sure it wasn't on this venue that I heard it. Not only did I hear it on this venue, it was within the last two months. So I went, oh, no, some words. And I said, <laughs> I think I better work uh, on another a uh, facet of this. So I hurriedly sent to Paul and said, uh, I can't do that one. You just did it because he was so kind. He went through all of our almost all of our roundtables and got the safety moment. So that was really nice of him. So I'm, I'm going to take a, a little bit of a different tack with the safety moment. I want you to know how much value there is in the safety moment for a, a adventure at a high adventure base. Um, this is the FAQs that are on the national website and they're very um, interesting to read through. There's some things in here that I never knew. I thought I knew everything of course, but that's not the case. I will say that Philmont has uh, a little more restrictions on things as, as some of the other bases do, but some of the other bases have different um, requirements that they um, push up on. 
Um, going into the backcountry at Philmont, everybody has to have height and weight restrictions um, um, passed by their doctor. Um, it's very important when you're going into the backcountry that you do have a lot of um, input from your doctor about the capabilities that you have or you think you might have. There's another um, document that uh, came up in the search. I think it was part of last month's, but I'm not sure that it, we got into it much. It's the medical risk fast factors for your participation in scouting. And it has a lot of information on the different kinds of um, illnesses uh, people have or um, different uh, dilemmas and how, how it would affect them at the different locations that they would go. And so it's a highly important document for uh, people to have their doctor read ahead of time. And uh, I think Philmont has a very nice one. Uh, I gave it to my doctor once and he says, well, you do all this stuff and you're very healthy, but you just don't kind of, I said, I will before I go, I promise. So I went back in and reweighed and I made it. So I, it, it gave me a, a plan. <laughs> um, so on, could you scroll, um, Paul? Yeah. Okay. So the beginning one is on the purpose. So these are people that have sent questions to national and they made it to the website and the answers, if just click on anyone, it doesn't matter. And then the, the answers are right there um, for you to see. Um, it's very important that that you get all the information that you can before you go to the bases you go to because that each one is unique in, in what it requires. And so um, health and weight information, that's uh, some people will be very heavy, but they have, they're healthy and they have, um, they take the water test or something like that. And, and there's different ones that you have to do. And you can't just go in. And another thing that I didn't know is you can't change that form in any way, shape or form. You have to give the national uh, form for your health, uh, your health form and all of your shots and everything like that. Um, you can't change it or take pieces off. They all have to be there when they go, whether they're filled in or not. Um, and maintaining records. Um, actually, none, none are supposed to be kept digitally. There are some um, uh, websites that the national bases are, or some of the camps that do high adventure use, and they're a secure facility so that's a different story. So check before you go. And if you're doing something with the, um, there, all of the, uh, shoot, all of the um, forms need to be on paper so that they can be destroyed easily when they become out of date or the young person moves to another place, the records go with them. And when they come home for an event, unless there's been some different order made, the forms come back to the unit or to the youth and they go home with them. So, I mean, that's the boring, it sounds like the boring stuff, but there's a lot of interesting information in this form itself. Um, let's see, where are you? You went all the, the way down? Yeah. Yes. Okay. And some of these, you know, when you open them up, there, there's a lot of stuff in them. And some of them, there's just a little tiny bit, but uh, they're very important. So I really um, want to encourage you to, uh, to uh, check all the documentation and all the paperwork that National puts out there for you to look at, because you don't want to get somewhere and find out you didn't bring your inhaler, so you're not going on the trek because there's nowhere for you to get your medication. And you got to carry the medication for all the days or you don't go. So it's very important that you read between the lines, so to speak. 
And the last thing I would like to say tonight to all you wonderful people that came out to this event, because <laughs> as you can see, I am canoeing. And as I move, that is actually me. And actually, the, right there in the back, the young man with the uniform on is smiling right now. And that's Ted Weiland, who was my guide when I did a master educator course at Northern Tier. I was very happy to have him twice on, on my trek because he did all the hard work. And I thank you for that, Ted, even today. Thank you, Paul. I hope that covers it. Thank you, Paula. Thank you very much. That, that was actually very useful, so thanks. So now it's time for our, our new feature for the, the round tables. Uh, tonight we have Scott Anderson, who is the chair of the National Outdoor Ethics and Conservation Committee. And he's got a question that we've received and he's got some answers. Uh, greetings, everybody. Great to see so many familiar faces. Uh, I will tell you that uh, I, at the end of each session that I was leading at the Outdoor Ethics and Conservation Conference, I was doing this little segment called Frequently Asked Questions. And uh, Paul got a lot of requests after that. Could we include it on the roundtable? So we're going to give this a go for a few months. And at each uh, of our roundtables, I'm going to try to address uh, at least one question that I'm asked frequently uh, as the chair of Outdoor Ethics and Conservation. Next slide. So today, it's where should outdoor ethics and conservation be in your council organization? And this most frequently came up after uh, the National Council merged the Outdoor Ethics and Conservation Committees. Many councils wanted to know, should we be doing the same thing? Is this the model that, that uh, we're requiring you to do? And next slide. <laughs> I will begin by saying that there are no national policies with the way a council should be organized in program divisions. So council leadership solely determines its own organizational structure to meet the priorities that it sets and to maximize the volunteer resources that they have. The national council does provide some recommendations in its supporting literature. And next slide. Uh, so we do have an outdoor programs committee guidebook. We also have a conservation committee guidebook. Each of those details ways in which a outdoor programs committee or a program committee could be organized and ways that a conservation committee could be organized. Next slide. But uh, just to try to break it down for you, if we look at outdoor ethics, uh, to begin with, councils are not required to have a council outdoor ethics advocate, nor a outdoor ethics committee. Uh, councils may have a priority in that area and may choose to have those positions or those committees, but they are not required by the National Council to have committees or to have someone serving as the council outdoor ethics advocate. The council outdoor ethics advocate is a standalone position. It's designed to serve as a liaison with many of the council's operating committees. A council outdoor ethics advocate will typically be the chair of a council's outdoor ethics committee, but that is not a requirement. It, there could be a council outdoor ethics committee chair, as well as an outdoor ethics committee or outdoor ethics advocate for the council. All of these things are decisions that are made by council leadership, not by the national council. Uh, if you'll step on, this was just an excerpt from that outdoor programs guide, and it shows that the executive board, uh, under the executive board is an outdoor programs committee, and on that committee, you'll see an outdoor ethics advocate at the top right, and that's just one model that a council may choose to use for their organization. Next slide. When we look at conservation, the same thing, councils are not required to have a council conservation committee. Most councils do, particularly if they're running summer camp programs. So councils have an intent to operate on a camp property, they are required to have a current conservation plan. And oftentimes they will form a conservation committee to develop and maintain those conservation plans. The council, if they do not have a, a 
uh, Conservation Committee must also have policies and procedures in place in order to administer the Distinguished Conservation Service Award. So just again, councils can organize themselves to meet their needs. They are not required to have a council conservation committee. Next slide. Uh, so I'm gonna look at that drawing again and same thing an outdoor programs committee and you'll see uh, there a conservation committee in the middle of the right hand side. So again, this was just one model that we were providing to councils that they might choose to use in, in their organization. Next slide. So uh, National Council's Outdoor Ethics and Conservation Committee, the lead National Council leadership determined that there was not a need for separate outdoor ethics and conservation representation on the National Outdoor Programs and Properties Committee. So that was why they merged them and they felt uh, if they just needed one person to represent, represent both of those interests, both outdoor ethics uh, on the National Outdoor Ethics and Conservation Committee, the Outdoor Ethics Division and the Conservation Division have a lot of activities that they do in a similar fashion, but they also have interests of their own. Uh, my, my best example here is the National, uh, the conservation group of our National Committee is focused heavily on trying to help provide good information for our councils to help them manage their properties. Our outdoor ethics group is really focused on delivering outdoor ethics education. Uh, and then we have a, an operations group that helps deliver that information to our councils. So both committees merged in 2021, and there was never a recommendation that councils follow that organizational model. Next slide. So, just to add some things here, there are many organizational models throughout our BSA councils. Some have outdoor ethics and conservation committees serving on a program committee. Some have conservation committees serving on council properties committee. Some conservation committees include outdoor ethics. Next slide. Uh, some council outdoor ethic advocates serve as a conservation chair. Some councils have council and district outdoor ethics committees. Some councils have conservation committees at each camp or as part of each camp properties committee. Some councils have neither an outdoor ethics advocate nor a council conservation committee. Next slide. So one more time, council leadership determines its own organizational structure to meet the priorities that it sets and to maximize the volunteer resources they have. Next slide. So what if my council doesn't have a conservation committee or a council outdoor ethics advocate, and you are interested in serving your council in one of those areas of interest? Ask, ask your scout executive, ask your council's vice president of program. Next slide. What are you going to ask? Or are you going to ask them, how can I serve the council in the area of interest that you're interested in? So how can I serve the council uh, outdoor ethics programs? Or how can I serve the council's conservation efforts? Uh, ask what the council's goals and objectives are in that area. How could my service best support those goals and objectives? And lastly, where would those efforts fit in the council's organizational structure? Uh, more than likely, they already have a plan for that and maybe just don't have the volunteers to support those efforts. So uh, next slide. So thank you all for all you do to support outdoor ethics and conservation in, in scouting. I'll be happy to answer any questions regarding this frequently asked question. Last slide. Hearing none, Paul, I will send it back to you. Okay, thank you, Scott. And once again, if you do think of something, you're welcome to put it in and we'll be around a bit afterwards. So it's time to move on to our announcements for the evening. And of course, I'm gonna come back and say, if you've got any ideas for any future topics you'd like to hear, please put them in the chat right now. I'm always looking for those ideas. If you got any comments on the round table or suggestions for us and you perhaps don't wish to put it in the chat, 
Um, we have an email address. Please send it to roundtable at outdoorethics-bsa.org, and we'll get it. And so we do appreciate your input very much. We also have a feedback page uh, set up and would love to hear from you that. Please do give your feedback. Um, I'm going to be doing my kind of wag of the finger at you guys right now because we'll get only a handful of uh, feedbacks from the many people who watch these and we'd like to hear from everybody. So please, uh, we would really appreciate your uh, taking the time to give us some feedback on the round table. That's, th that's how we make them better for everybody. Save the date. The National Outdoor Conference is coming up at the end of September. There will be more information to follow as soon as uh, we've got that. That will all be posted. Um, here we go. We have upcoming master educator courses. Just added uh, one and it's coming up soon. So we have a course coming up in May at uh, Summit Bechtel. And uh, all these courses, uh, you can find them on our outdoorethics-bsa.org slash, well, there it is, slash training slash ME underscore courses. Um, or you can go through just uh, the, the regular outdoor ethics uh, page here. And I've got something turned on here. I'm sorry, I'm drawing on the screen. Anyway, so here, here's the up to upcoming classes. If you uh, need uh, financial help in attending one of these classes, do check out the Dan Howell Scholarship. Um, the link is right there on the page and uh, you can get some assistance to help you to attend these classes. We want everyone to be able to attend these classes who would like to. So with that, it's time for me to get my, my chance and, and read my, uh, my, my Aldo Leopold for the evening for you. Uh, you remember last month, I read from November as well. I kind of like the November. So here's another reading from it. The flock emerges from the low clouds, a tattered banner of birds, dipping and rising, blown up and blown down, blown together and blown apart, but advancing, the wind wrestling loving, lovingly with each winnowing wing. When the flock is a blur in the far sky, I hear the last honk, sounding taps for summer. So Aldo wrote this about geese, and you'll see that picture I put there. I actually have pigeons for that picture. And I did that on purpose because this is something I, I think we can do is, is go outside and just look at the birds and see how they appear to be affected by the wind. Um, see what's going on. You don't have to be out in, in wilderness to do that. You can do that wherever you are. Go out and look at the birds. Look at how they're responding to the environment and think about how everything around you is responding to that environment and to the wind. Um, it's, it's a great way to have your youth do that as well and, and get them connected with paying attention to what's going on in the world around them. With that, um, We've reached the end of this round table. I, once again, I put up the plug for the, for the survey. We'd love to hear from, from everyone. Uh, next month uh, on the 11th of March, we'll have another, I think, great round table coming up. Uh, this one will have Craig Hensley uh, uh, from the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. will be talking to us about interpretation, how we can use it to improve our outdoor programs. So I hope to see you all again next month. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Paul, <clears throat> something that was in chat that I can answer. All um, right. Texas 2024. Keep your eyes open. Texas 2024. All right.